Welcome to Babbin' Over Brews. Deep thoughts fermented over time and text. I'm coming at you, Aaron Crew, Juice Vavirk, and I've got Gumby. Hey, what's happening? I've got Keith. How's it hanging? I've got Sam. How's it going? And our guest of honor, Mr. David Inesco. Hey. We'll be sipping on Samuel Adams Cherry Wheat. Crisp and fruity with a hint of honey. This ale brew with Michigan cherries is light on the palate, yet full of surprising depth and flavor. The cherries contribute a tart character while a touch of honey adds a slight sweetness. This is a color, is a hazy gold SRM of 6.2. All right, gents. Aaron, I'm trying to pour it the way we're supposed to pour it. That's right. That. About a quarter inch head, beautiful. <laughs> so one of the reasons, as as uh, Gumby knows, when you go to pour, you want a little more head if it is a heady beer, because as you pour it, you can start slow, but then you'll speed it up, because it releases the gases, which prevents you from getting an upset stomach. So being bloated. That's right. Here's to that. Cheers. All right. Cheers. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> And this is a nice golden color. It's mm-hmm. a little heady. Nice aroma yes. off the top. It's almost floral, almost flowery. I'm relieved it's Michigan cherries and not Aldi cherries. <laughs> Those are totally nervous. It's like one bad week, it's like, this bag is amazing. And then the next week, you're like, the worm coming out of it. <laughs> we have that, that beautiful water up by the, uh, by the UP, right? <laughs> mm. I just actually got done canning some cherries and uh, all that pulp. That was left mm. over, just extracting all that. Ooh, I could drink that stuff straight. Mm. <laughs> Man, that oh, is there. a beautiful, full, robust flavor. Mm-hmm. Mm. Perfect for this uh, hot day. Oh, I'm telling you, this is a nice, uh, is a nice fruity, summery type of beer. Light, yeah. light, yeah, which is really great for the end of Don't summer. Heavy, yeah. It's an old, old favorite of mine too. I, just, I drank a lot of this when I was a bit younger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Sam Adams is consistently good. This would go so good with fish. It's okay for guys to like fruity beers. I felt like I had a closet. Yeah, and to your point, Aaron, anything that has the word Sam in it is good. <laughs> There's bias. <laughs> I think it's sure. your it's your humility that extols the goodness of that name. It's you know, your humble character. Amen. <laughs> Humility? Mm. <laughs> it is prophetized. <laughs> so, Gumby, how'd your recent concert go? Uh, good. My last gig at uh, Brothers Lounge went really well. Awesome. Uh, I'll be gigging out again on the 12th. Oh, yeah. Where at? Smedley's on the rain. All right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know Smedley's, where it is. Smedley's, yeah. So, it's for the Blue Society. Which Armstrong will be playing with us. Um, many great blues players. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So I'm having fun doing it. Making so, a little money. Doesn't hurt. Yeah. <laughs> they say if you enjoy what you do for a living, you'll never work a day in your life. That's exactly it. You know, I, I my mother knew when I was born, and I'd be at church with her on her shoulder whenever the music started playing. I would just start tapping all in it, and I used to beat her shoulder. So I, I knew from the moment that wow. I can comprehend that I wanted to be a drummer wow. that I would. Wow. That's cool. awesome. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that feeling of being called to something. Yeah. yeah. The so. Ringo of the Latina sect. Yeah. <laughs> Ringo, oh, yeah, he's a great drummer. <laughs> Keith, what you been up to? Well, as uh, folks in the studio can tell, I had an internet outage for a few hours this morning, and it resulted in my hair getting dyed pink. I didn't even notice. Nobody noticed. <laughs> no. I, actually, it was funny as I'm walking around my neighborhood and be, people be like, it will just give me the weirdest look and I'll just, because I can't see my hair. <laughs> so they'll be like, did you lose a bet? What happened to you? <laughs> did your daughters get to you while you were sleeping? What's going on? <laughs> but no, it was just a bottle of, of pink hair dye that was just. Kind of has a pur- purple look to it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, you know, I you're thought. right. The mirror kind of. Yeah. Yeah. It's a nice shimmer. It's a nice shimmer. You must have really good hair conditioning. That's my goal is to shimmer <laughs> as much as possible. <laughs> hey, Sam? Honestly, I've just been working all day, working all the time. Um, I just got a new 3D printer, so I've been playing around with that. Oh, nice. And uh, 
just uh, doing some stuff for the homely life. What's uh, the first thing you printed? The first thing I printed was a Benchy. Uh, the Benchy boat. Wait, what is that? That is a little, um, it's like a fishing boat, but oh, okay. it's a file that everyone prints as their first or second print oh, in order it's to. Hello World! Yes, oh. yes. Uh, yeah, it, in order that. to calibrate your machine and make sure that it's not strain, it's not, it's all calibrated away. That's what that's called? Yep. It's called a Benchy. Called it annoying. But yeah, I, all right. No, 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 you're, you're confusing the item with me. <laughs> okay, what's the second Mr. thing? Mr. Humble. Oh, the second thing I printed was the uh, cat, the meow cat, which is also a calibration test. Wait, you mean like the little, like, the little cat <laughs> well, that goes, like, swinging but The one with the one over? paw in the air. Yeah. So what's the first thing you printed that was, like, you? Okay, so the first thing, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. The first thing that I printed was a uh, HeroScape uh, tile. It's for my friends. Uh, we're going to be playing a lot of D&D later on. And so we wanted to have dungeon tiles. So oh, nice. HeroScape tiles kind of work really well with that. Hmm. I didn't thought of that 3D printing uses, but it truly can be used for anything. It can be used for anything, including things that we aren't allowed to talk on radio about. <laughs> Wait, God bless us. <laughs> God hey, bless I, the Second Amendment. That's go back all I to say. this beer for a second. Can I say I like it better in the bottle than all in right. the glass? That's why I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's got a stronger flavor from the bottle. Mm. Oh. I believe it. I believe it. I wonder if that's the CO2. <laughs> maybe. Maybe I'll be bloated, <laughs> but it tastes better to me. You know, it it probably is containing the, uh, the it, there's less off-gassing, mm -hmm. so it could be containing more of the flavor. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's definitely a thinner taste when it's in the glass. Yeah, and that's enti entirely possible because there is off gassing once you pour it. So, <laughs> good job, Sam. All right. So, Mr. David Anesco, we have we have questions. Yes, I, I hope I have answers. So, please tell us uh, this fantastic item that you are an expert on. Well, the Shroud of Turin, um, the most studied object in human history. People don't realize that, but it is. Um, not the uh, pyramids of Egypt, not the black holes of space, but a bloody, dirty, stained linen cloth. Long, uh, wide linen cloth, the most studied object in history. Mm. And when I first discovered it in 1980, I saw a National Geographic article, uh, because two years prior, in 1978, a team of American scientists called STIRP, Shroud of Turin Research Project, were given the cloth for five 24-hour round-the-clock days following a public exhibition of three months. So that was in 78, and two years later, National Geographic came out with an article and it just so happened that my mother passed away in 1980, and I was kind of in a spiritual fog. I was kind of wandering around. She was a wonderful woman, died young. Uh, you know, Lord, why, you know, why did she go on? So, you know, kind of just, I had some questions, and um, I read this article. And growing up in a parochial education and understanding the foundations of Christianity, the Bible, Jesus took our sins on his body, died in the cross, rose from the dead. I was, I was comfortable with that foundation. I believed it. But boy, when I read this magazine article in 1980, uh, I saw forensic evidence that backed up what I had believed. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was a game changer. I said to myself, I have to tell people, everyone I, I could tell, they have to know about this. So that began a journey of trying to gather as much information as I could. I've been to eight scientific theological conferences, uh, uh, one in Rome, and um, wow. So I've been I've been looking at it since 1980, and uh, about the about eight, 1989 I began speaking about it. And um, they call people like me shroudies. If you like Star Trek, you might be a Trekkie. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm a shroudie. And there are a lot of shroudies out there. 
And uh, because when it grabs you and you understand what it is, um, it's truly an amazing, amazing thing. And it, it demands, it, it requires our attention. And so it's kept mine for f- over 40 years. It's amazing. And I'll be uh, uh, speaking next month in Pittsburgh for two nights, back to back. And um, it's just uh, something that has never abated my fascination with it. Has never. And the more we find out about it, the more questions that are answered, the more questions are raised. Okay. Mm. And so uh, it's, 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 oh, yeah, it's really got- been a great journey. I got a lot questions. of wonderful people. Good. <laughs> I'll be completely honest. Before tonight, I've actually never even heard of Shroud of Turin. And, and, but... and, and, you know, Sam, that I get three answers. Uh, yeah, isn't that the burial cloth of Jesus? Uh, yeah, they, I know what it is. They proved it a fake. And a third one is, no, what is it? Yeah, I was about to say, the, uh, the almighty Google, the first thing when you put Shroud is of Turin, and then it autofills to debunked. And then the second one is new evidence. So there's definitely a bit of controversy so, around yeah. it. So for those who aren't familiar, give us some background on it because yeah. it, it was uh, it was a bit later in medieval history when it was rediscovered, right? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. It's a long uh, linen burial sheet, 14 feet, 3 inches long, 3 feet, 7 inches wide, which I want to ask you, is it a coincidence that those measurements measure exactly 8 cubits by 2 cubits, which is the Jewish uh, measuring tool? And why would it measure eight by two cubits? Because it was cut for a Jewish man. Mm. It's that simple. But it was... Uh, oh. Let's keep going. Okay, yes. So the shroud, if it's the authentic burial cloth of Christ, we have to take it back to the tomb. And uh, it's history. There are some gaps. We have to fill in the gaps. And so what we believe, there was a burial cloth. There was a cloth uh, in the first century that had an image on it. It was called the image of Edessa. And it was given to a king who lived during the time of Christ. And and I'm not going to get into the long story. But the point is, during the time of Christ, there was a cloth that was purported to have a, a likeness, an image of Christ on it, a face cloth, and that it was miraculously made. For reasons I won't get into because of time, it disappeared for about 500 years, and it was bricked up into the wall of the city uh, to keep it protected from a son of the king who was not, he was a pagan, and they thought, and he was persecuting Christians at the time and destroying artifacts. And so this face cloth, which had a likeness of Christ, disappeared for 500 years. It thought, it, it, the thought is it was bricked up in the wall to uh, prevent it from being destroyed. And after a flood in the 6th century, in the rebuilding of the wall, they discovered it above the western gate. And the thing unique about this image of the face only is it was described as being tetra diplone. What does tetra mean in Spanish? Cuatro, four. So tetra diplone means it was doubled four times. It was folded four times, this face cloth. Well, when you fold the shroud four times, tetra diplone, all you get is the face. It's believed that in the first century, the cloth that was given to Abgar, said to have King Abgar, to have the image of Christ's face on it, miraculously imprinted, was the Shroud of Turin folded up and hidden because the Jews wouldn't have run out of the tomb saying, look what we found. They'd have been unclean. They'd have been kicked out of the Jewish faith. So they would have had reason to keep it hidden and maybe disguised. So 600 years later, in rediscovering it, they discover it's a full-length burial cloth. Actually, it was discovered as full-length 400 years later when the Byzantine army came to Edessa, which was now under Muslim control, and said, give us that holy sheet or we'll destroy this place. They gave it up. And in the about 960, there were religious leaders in the Byzantine church who described this face cloth 
as being a full-length cloth, double in four. So we believe what was testified as being a full-length cloth in about 960 was actually the burial cloth of Christ disguised as a face cloth in the first century. And so from that point forward, from about 1000 A.D., we can trace the shroud where it's been uh, very accurately. But we have to fill in some gaps and do a little detective work to say, well, I think we can take it back to the tomb this way. Because unless, and, and you know, I mean, some people say, well, if you can't take it back to the tomb, you don't know, so on and so forth. Well, there's pollen on the shroud that has been lifted off the surface, thorn pollens that bloom in March and April of the year, Passover, and hail only from Jerusalem, pollen on the cloth. See, the thing about the shroud is that it's, a mid, it's been debunked as a medieval forgery, that it came back in 1988, it was carbon dated, and it came back 1260 to 1390. So a medieval forger would have had to have created a 3D, three-dimensional image in photo-negative relief before the invention of photography. He would have had to have put pollen on it without knowing it existed because the microscope wasn't invented at that time. There's dirt in the feet re region of the man uh, on the cloth, in the, on the cloth, in the foot region, there's dirt that has a mineral called travertine aragonite, comes from one place on the earth, Jerusalem. So you'd have to say to the medieval forger, wow, you knew all this before it was even thought of, because we never saw it, anticipating 500 years later, photography would be in and they would be able to see, uh, you know, the photo negative relief. And um, it's just a preposterous thought. Right. And so, but yet people, you know, if it's not negative, it's not news. So, you know, they've been trying to put Jesus back in the closet for, you know, since the beginning. And so, you know, once it came back carbon dated medieval, that's it. You know, it's it's over the shroud study. We can put it away and not. But we know now why it dated medieval, because the sample they took for the testing came from a site that was the most contaminated site on the cloth. It was an edge. You know, it's 14 feet long, so if they wanted to hold it up to the masses, no pun intended, group of people, they would have had to have held it horizontally. Maybe a half a dozen priests or bishops. So over the centuries, those paws on that fabric would have caused it to deteriorate. So they had to, in 1532, it was in a fire. And it almost destroyed the cloth, but it didn't. But it created burn marks on either side of the image. The burn could have come right through the center of the image, destroying it. But it's almost as if it was framed miraculously by the fire damage. And the image was not touched. The upper shoulders were damaged. You can't see them. So in 1534, they sewed patches on it. And, um, you know, it, it's been... I believe uh, we've come as close as we can to authenticating it without actually saying so. It's up to people what they decide. But, um, but anyway, it's been uh, a controversial for a long time. It continues to be. It's interesting, during the pandemic, when all churches were shut down worldwide, the Catholic Church brought out the shroud, and there was a solemn ceremony uh, during the weeks uh, of churches shut down around the world, especially during Easter, uh, that uh, God brought the shroud out uh, to, to comfort people during uh, trying time. That's off to the Catholic Church? <laughs> yes. I, I, I'm i just one of the Catholics. I have no authority there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I just participate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, uh, the story needs to get told. Uh, many scientists who were by nature agnostic and atheists have come to faith in Christ because of their numbers, mm -hmm. their analytics, their data. We're telling them this can only be uh, one thing. And so... People say, "Has have you ever seen a miracle with the shroud? It's you can't touch it and have a cancer healed." But the biggest miracle of all could be uh, the changed lives of people who've come to understand what it is. It's a light image. 
which was created by the body. It wasn't a photographic uh, element outside the body. It wasn't reflected light. It was internal. The light came from the body. Uh, they know how far, far away his eye sockets were from the cloth that passed over because what created the image acted through space and over time, a very short space and a very short amount of time. And the image was created by light from the body. And the darker the image on the cloth, the greater number of fibers that were discolored. You see, it takes about 100 fibers, which is one-tenth of a human hair, to make a thread. They're woven together, and you got a thread. You look at the thread under the microscope, and the top two fibers, one-tenth of a human hair, have been discolored, yellowed prematurely aged, like putting a newspaper in the sunlight, and it becomes yellow within a few hours. The first couple of fibers of the thread became yellowed, became aged, discolored. What happens when you stand in the sun? You turn brown. You turn yellow-brown. It, 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 that's what happens with ultraviolet light. So the nose, for instance, has many, many, many fibers discolored. Why? Because the cloth was touching the nose. So those fibers were inundated with light, if you will. The eye sockets have far fewer fibrils discolored because it was at a distance from the cloth. But as the cloth passed through the body, that became illuminated with light. Mm. It it's not the right word, but scorched the top two fibers only of a hundred. Hmm. Now, if a medieval forger painted it, and by the way, you can't see the shroud unless you're about 12 feet away. If you're too close, it blurs. Too far away, can't make out the image. So if it was a painting, a painter had to have a long arm or a long brush to paint, and the bristle of his brush would have been thicker than the fiber he was painting. Is this what we're looking at here? Yep. Is that what that is? Okay. What he's describing? Yep. Yeah. Um, and the fibers of the image are not cemented together. You can take a needle and lift them up. And underneath the top two, the 98 fibers beneath are pure white. So, you know, whatever created the shroud image... Is, is has not been duplicated, can't be duplicated, mm. and um, uh, has been the ongoing uh, quest of many scientists for many, many years now to try to figure out just how this image was created. Um, it's not a scorch. It acts like a scorch, but it's not a scorch, not a painting of any kind. No stain, dyes, pigments of any kind are on there. The only art uh, painting uh, correlation to this because they have found minute specks of paint on the shroud mm. but they know why because it's been documented people would create paintings copies and they would sanctify the copy by laying it over the shroud oh. you got a first class second class relic now and now you take it off and you say this was laid on and sanctified by the shroud. So there must have been a few flakes left behind. And that's the only reason why there are particles on the shroud. Okay. But um, so, you know, uh, and it's also holographic. It has holographic information. And I don't know a whole lot about holographs, but I do know you need laser beams to make them. Yeah. Laser excuse me, laser beams intersect at different angles, and that's how you make a, a hologram. What's the holographic information inside of it? Well, it's just that you can, you can um, uh, get the image in the holographic format, whatever it is, and you could actually turn it to the side and look at side profiles of both sides. So it gives you, you know, um, just a greater depth of the body image through the hologram. 
I mean, they've done holograms of Michael Jackson, you know, with his image uh, being intersected at various angles, and now he's doing something on stage. Yep. Yeah. Well, um, so that was discovered about 10 years ago, that it has holographic information as well as uh, three-dimensional information. Keep the questions coming. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to know if, like, the, the facial structure, the bone structure, has also been confirmed to be that of someone you know, 2000 years ago, someone of that region too, because that is of the entire shroud. That is the most specific and detailed uh, part. I mean, even, even having hair follicles on the side of that face, I would not think would be imprinted on, uh, on a piece of cloth. Yeah, that that's true. Um, so, you know, um, this, quest of mine for over 40 years now uh, uh i i've i've been able to meet many many men and women uh in the world who are more expert than i am on the shroud and they've had intimate uh, contact with it but it was through that um my uh, searching over the years that have, have allowed me to meet many of the experts in the world and when I first started this, all I did was look at a magazine article, and it led me to, I mentioned earlier, the scientific theological conferences, but I've also looked under the microscope at blood lifted off the surface of the shroud. Mm. I believe I was looking at the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Mm. That's where I saw pollen particles, thorn pollens, under the microscope. Uh, in the, uh, from, from, uh, they put scotch tape over the shroud, lifted it off, and then you have evidence that was pulled off the weave between the threads that you can't get any other way sticking to the adhesive of the tape looking at it under a microscope they found wings of flies they found wax because candles have been held over it to look at it for centuries um, they found a lot of extraneous debris uh, but they've also found the pollen from about 50 some different types of plants that follow the historical route of the shroud. The shroud was in Turkey, in Constantinople. There are uh, pollen particles from Constantinople. There are pollen particles from Edessa, which is where King Abgar received the facial image. Mm. Uh, there are pollens from that area on the cloth. Kind of uh, uh, corroborating the thought that maybe that face cloth and the shroud were one and the same because the pollen came from the geographical region. Um, Interesting. Israel, France, Italy, you know, it's been, those pollens have been there. But the, 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 the evidence lifted off the shroud through sticky tape follows the historical route of this cloth. It's an amazing thing, confirmation. Yeah. That, that's what I was going to bring up. Um, you mentioned earlier that the conquest of the Muslim wanting to get the shroud so obviously it has symbolic meaning to the muslim world it has meaning to the christian world right protestant world uh, well the muslims had it because of conquest you know a spoil of war right i don't think they were looking to you know look at it the same way we might look at it maybe not but they i, I know they do have some reverence whether or not they accept Christ is the Messiah, but it, it had meaning to them. Yeah, it did, because they, they gave away a copy of it initially, and they discovered this is not the real thing. It's a copy, because they were trying to fool the Byzantine army, and they said, look, we'll, we'll level the place. Give us the real thing. And obviously so, the Catholic world, it has great meaning to them. And the Orthodox. And I was, was just... in Constantinople for a few hundred years, which was the center of the Byzantine you know, world, if you will. So that would leave me one question of, you know, of all the major Abrahamic faiths, uh, Orthodox Judaism. Like, does it have the same meaning to them? Are they going after it? Do they want it? Do they care about it? Like, what is their... Yeah, interesting. Uh, no, there hasn't been a whole lot of that with them. Okay. Uh, the You know, Hebrew nationals, if you will, or Orthodox Jews. There is, by the way, a shroud museum that opened in Jerusalem about 10 years ago. In Jerusalem, a shroud museum. Right in the Holy... God did that, of course. But it's interesting. <clears throat> There's a gentleman by the name of Barry Schwartz 
who uh, was the he was Jewish, uh, raised Orthodox Jew, and he was asked to be part of the team in 1978, the Sturp team. And a fellow called him. He was a he had a fo- photographic studio and said, Barry, would you be interested in coming aboard on this team? We're going to look at the Shroud of Turin. And uh, many people have said about the shroud, the what of where? You know, he had no idea what it was. And when he was told what it was, we we're going to send a team over there to look at it. He said to the fellow who asked him if he wanted to come, you know, I'm Jewish, don't you? You know, and the fellow said, well, so am I. But that shouldn't have any bearing on your professional work. And so he followed his friend's advice and to this day, he has Shroud.com, the largest website in the world, most extensive. And to talk about your Muslim connection a moment ago, for about six, seven years now, he's, he was invited to the Ahmadiyya Muslim group, which is a very moderate, peace-loving group. And they have every year a convention in London 30,000 people come, and he was asked to come speak. Now, uh, think of the uh, sense of humor of God. He had someone raised as an Orthodox Jew hawking a Christian relic to a group of Muslims. (laughs) And he's been invited back uh, many times. And he said the first time, of course, he says, you might have might imagine my uh, trepidation standing up there, a Jewish man looking fully Jewish in front of 30,000 Muslims. Mm. <laughs> he said, I had I was a little bit reticent, reticent at the beginning. You could understand why. Yeah. But the Muslims have been exposed to it, the Ahmadiyya group. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they have a, a bit of a history with uh, Christ as well. Um, it's it's interesting with uh, with the Jewish sects because there's there's some talk back and forth. Most uh, most of the Islamic people don't believe that Jesus died, right? Yeah, but right. some of them do, and it's yeah. beca- and it's actually because of the text. So the text they say, well, uh, the uh, Jewish people didn't kill him, right? And then if you go into the Quran, there's a reference to that, right? Mm-hmm. But that's correct. Because it wasn't the Jewish people. The Romans did it for him. It was the Romans, right? So, so there are now uh, among the Islamic people those who do believe who do believe that Christ did die because of that, you know, confusion right there. So that that shows you that because in in their in their context they'd say, well, the Quran cannot be wrong, right? Well, this actually corroborates that it may be right in this context. So, so now you do have a uh, different sex in, in in Islam that do um, stand up for the fact that Jesus Christ did die. So it's very interesting to see the back and forth between Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can see the implications of people wanting to prove it as a as a fake, right? Because then Christianity's debunked and we're done with that. But the implications if it's proved real is that I think it has an element to combine all the Abrahamic faiths to it. That's huge. Yeah, it is huge. Yeah. So I could, you know, I could see kind of both sides to it and why there would be a push <laughs> in that, that struggle. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I see Keith oh, I, stirring. I push on that particular point, Gumby, actually a little bit. Yeah, no, go push. I didn't, I didn't think I'd be questioning Gumby for a second, <laughs> considering our, our uh, guest here. Um <laughs> But I mean, if the shroud was proven and proven as, you know, yeah. loaded term of like, sure. how do you prove anything? Right. Um, that's when you're looking at historical evidence. It would not debunk Christianity. All it would prove, I mean, Christians have been dealing with fake relics, fake, you know, that I remember that Very story we talked about time. a year or two ago about the guy who was passing around a, a, a Bible that supposedly oozed oil. Like just a few years ago, through the American South, yeah, and it was found out later he was buying a bunch of oil from like a farm store. Um, <laughs> so it wouldn't, it would not prove his faith. And on the other hand, if the shroud is proven true, I mean, or is it as proven that it is a a image of someone crucified? That doesn't necessarily ironclad prove that that was Jesus, right? Absence of you know some, right? I don't know a name tag, a license, a license uh, we yeah. found on the. <laughs> yeah. What would it be? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, implications. I said. I mean, yeah. definitely not. You know, I I understand how the world works today, and you know, unless something could be quantified or proven on paper, then you yeah. know, 
then it's not true. So I, that's why I said implications. Mm-hmm. But you could see throughout history, I mean, that at least at one point, every major faith wanted its hands on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why, yeah. why? To control the narrative of Jesus? Mm. Mm-hmm. And why would you want to control the narrative of Jesus mm-hmm. Yeah, if you're a Muslim? Mm-hmm. It is fascinating because I, I do have questions about the image itself. And I don't even know if I can form all of my questions about the image because it is fascinating that it it has not been duplicated. And if you look at it, I wonder what kind of ancient methods could have been used to try to duplicate it. Mm-hmm. I don't know of any. No. You know, it's it, that's what kind of fascinates me about this. Well, actually, since you've been probably studied this a lot, could you talk us through the 2009 supposed duplication by, what's his name, Professor Gareth Shelley? Like why that doesn't represent a legit? I, I, I mean, I know he, I know he didn't get it perfectly, but he seemed to got it in the ballpark, at least the naked eye. I, I, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, there are so many studies going on; it's almost impossible to keep up with all of them, you know. Um, but um, you know, I think I think uh, can we ever fully authenticate it? Probably not, and maybe that's the way God wants it, because mm. there has to be an element of faith. Sure. Uh, uh, to you know, to coming to the Lord, there has to be. Well, you know, I didn't see it, uh, but there's testimony of it, and I believe it. Uh, so, you know, if if it was, of course, when when it was carbon dated and it came out medieval, every world, uh, uh, you know, uh, major city in the world, uh, their newspaper article the next day, shroud debunked, shrouds a hoax, shrouds a forgery. They really want that because they can put Christianity to bed. It makes, uh, you know, the, the world government uh, more more likely, if you will. Mm-hmm. But um, so, you know, um, will it ever be uh, officially proven? Probably not. You'll always have your naysayers. But the more I've been studying it, and it's over 40 years now, and I never used to say it. I used to let the audience make up their mind. Uh, but at the beginning of my talks, I say this, you got two choices. This is either Jesus Christ of Nazareth or it's someone crucified exactly like him. It's a real man. It's a real human figure. It's not a forgery in any way. Um, and so those are the choices and when you look at why would they crucify another man and put a crown of thorns on him, spear him in the side, why would they do that as a cruel mockery of, of Christianity? Unlikely. And how would they get the image on there? And there have been some, I mean, you'd have to have fresh blood. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean it, it, gets, it, it gets into the impossible. Yeah. Mm. And so, um, you know, I, I now... Personally, now I can't tell anyone else, but after studying it as long as I have, I'm convinced of its authenticity. And I believe God has given it to us uh, uh, specifically for this time in human history, which can unlock uh, much of the, the mystery of it, because yeah. we have the technology now to do it. It's almost as if it's been waiting 1,900 years for a time on the earth when things would be breaking down all around us. And here we have the advances of science saying this appears to be an authentic image of a man who was crucified exactly like Jesus. And the forensics that go with it are enough to add the icing on the cake, in my view. So to grab that that idea and to question Keith a little bit on that study, um, so we've, we've already heard some of the testimony of the different ways that it's been authenticated. So in that duplication, was he able to, like uh, Dave was saying, take the two fibers out of each strand and create the duplication and not affect the other, the other fibers of each one of those strands of, uh, of uh, a fiber? Because in each one of those strands, only two of them in each, in each of them had changed, as well as, he, as, well as the... Uh, uh, the dirt and the fibers from each one of those countries going all the way back. How, how far did that duplication go? 
I got to be frank. I don't know what half that stuff means. I've been studying the shroud since this morning. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll say the, the one interesting thing about the re if it is going to be reproduced, I think it will be reproduced in the manner that this professor did it, which was you know, almost one of the most remarkable things to me when I just look at it as a skeptic is that there isn't really any material left to like kind of you know describe or cover the image itself, the body outline. Um, so in any case, to me, it's some kind of burning or surface transformation of something that's been removed. So the technique this professor used was this acid pigmentation where they put on an acidic pigment and kind of approximated the, you know, the structure of the, the body image and then washed it off. And we're left with a very thin discoloration that did, that yep. did not represent. It didn't leave any residue left over. Yeah. All right. So That's I think if there is a way to reproduce it and, you know, to reproduce it, we have to go back into the mind, you know, if it is a forgery of that era of someone in the 12th or 13th century. Yeah, yeah. Mm. There, um, yeah. there have been uh, attempts to reproduce the image that have come close. But when you when you look at all the unique characteristics, is it three dimensional? You know, is it uh, only two fibers? Is it a surface thing or did it go deeper in? Uh, there, there are so many things to take, but there have been attempts to reproduce it that have come close. But when you... Add all of it in. No, it doesn't fulfill this characteristic, so we can scratch that. Or it doesn't, you know, do this, so so we can scratch that. What I will say is about, um, I'm thinking maybe 10 years ago, 15 at the most, there was a group in Italy from Padua, Italy, scientists, who were able to duplicate a thread being discolored. They were able to do, because the image on the shrouds, on the threads, is around the circumference. It's not in the middle of the thread. In the medulla, there's nothing. It's only around the surface of, of the fiber. And they were able to discolor uh, one fiber, the same color as the shroud, the same depth, without the middle medulla being damaged. And it only took three to five billion watts of power at one forty billionth of a second or 40 nanoseconds. That's how long it took in a vacuum, ultraviolet light, to discolor one fiber, the exact coloration, duplication of the image fiber on the cloth itself, three to five billion watts of power, one forty billionth of a second for the laser. They said there's not enough power in the universe to recreate this. We don't. We don't have enough. Yeah, I was just gonna say. We'll know the truth about Kennedy before that. <laughs> One point twenty-one gigawatts. That touch fibers and don't touch fibers. So we're talking about okay, a woven cloth like my shirt. It's very smart, hard to see, obviously, on my shirt. But there's gonna be like fibers going across, like some yes. kind of weaving pattern. Oh yeah, yeah. Is it over is, under the is whole the bit. shroud like multiple ply? Is there multiple layers of fiber when you say that it's touching one and not the other? What do you mean by that? No, there's not multiple layers. No, it's just, uh, you know, just the cloth itself. And, uh, um, you know, th there is no residue on the cloth that came from an image. There is no pigment, paint, stain, dye, nothing. Only a discoloration of fiber. Two fibers deep into a hundred that make up the thread. It's a three to one herringbone twill weave with a Z twist. Don't ask me what that means, but that's what it is for the um, textile experts on, uh, out there. A three to one herringbone weave with a Z twist. Uh, it would have been an expensive piece of linen in the first century. Probably Joseph of Arimathea bought it. He went say. to Pilate. Went to the temple store with all the cloth, said, I need this. Give me eight cubits by two. Bam, grabbed it, ran, buried them. But it was an expensive piece of, piece of cloth, probably woven in what is now Syria, north of Israel, because back then there were um, uh, wonderful textiles produced out of that region. Short distance from Israel. Someone went up there, bought a few bolts, came back, filled the temple store, and that's where Joe... Uh, grabbed his, uh, uh, his burial cloth from to, to wrap Christ. Mm -hmm. So very expensive garment, would have been produced in the, in the first century. Uh, and by the way, uh, who wore linen? Kings, priests. He was a prophet, but they didn't wear linen. They wore, uh, you know, camel hair. Uh, but um, 
so Jesus was all three. So he was as a as a priest, our high priest, wrapped in linen, and uh, you know, as a king, he was wrapped in linen. Most crucifixion victims back then were thrown outside the city on a large pile. Let the animals and the birds of prey come do their thing. Within months, you got bones, white bleached bones. This man was buried in an expensive piece of linen. Very unusual. Very, very, very unusual. Expensive, yeah. Would that linen have been, because I've heard some claims that that wasn't, there was no contemporary burial cloth anyone's been able to find that's been a three to one twill, whatever. Weave, yeah. Is, would it have been the case that he might have bought and purchased cloth that wasn't used for burial? Is that the, the thinking behind that? It could have been. There's actually a, uh, a very good question, by the way, um, for a guy who just started studying this morning. Um, we keep him around. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. John Jackson, personal friend, uh, led the team in 1978, the Stirp team. And um, what was your question again, real quick? What was your... So uh, one objection is that the type of cloth, the type of weave, is not representative of any known burial cloth from that era. So yeah. could it have come from somewhere else? I'm kind of leading the question. There. Yeah. There, there, a different purpose, I should say. Right. There aren't many examples of cloth with that weave in antiquity. They had a hard time finding. They found a couple, not many. But um, I was forget what I was going to say. That happens a lot these days. It was about the, the person from Sturp. Yeah, John Jackson. Yeah, yeah. He, he led the team, and he there was a point. It'll come back to me. <laughs> that happens a lot these days, you know. Yeah, Thoughts come and go. <laughs> Forgive yeah, me for they... not being a good Christian, but when when he died, um, something about being the veil being torn was that also in a cloth in the temple? In the temple, yeah, it was in the it temple. Was a curtain, it was separate, a curtain. four inches thick, yeah. four inches thick. Okay. So it could not have been that cloth that was torn, and therefore, no. a very expensive cloth. A very, you know, no, okay. good. No, it's good. Good question, but no. Yeah. Second of all, um, when you're wrapped, when you when you die and you're wrapped in linen, and you you have a lie, I presume, or some type of other preservative put on you, could that also have had a chemical effect? Uh, biological preservatives. That's been that looked at. Very good question. Aloes and myrrh. Myrrh and aloes was, was surrounded the body, uh, and spices, and and the and and it's been thought that uh, the myrrh and the aloe uh, uh, sensitized the cloth to light. Hmm. So, unbeknownst to them, what they put around the body to arrest the smell of the decaying flesh, which, by the way, there's no body rot on the cloth, no decay whatsoever. The Bible says he will not allow his son to see corruption. Uh, the body begins to break down about day four in the tombs of Israel. This had no decomposition or corruption on it, which means the body and the cloth separated in less than four days so that no decomposition was on the body. You know, but but the uh, spices and chemicals, uh, aloe and myrrh put around the body, it's been thought that that may have acted as a catalyst to photo to photographically sensitize the cloth to light if and when it did show up. Mm. Uh, my second question for you was the, the face looked very familiar to me. Like I said, the Shroud of Turin is very new to me uh, as with Keith. That's the third um, question. Oh, third, fourth. <laughs> We're going to be doing questions all night. It's okay. <laughs> hey, man, this single malt whiskey is good, too, okay? <laughs> but uh, it looked very familiar to me, and what it reminded me of was a picture of Christ in the Eucharist, uh, holding up the cracker with the drink. In, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if it's more of a confirmation bias that we may have that the likeness of what we think Jesus would look like is either does it come from the Shroud of Turin? Does it come from our own? Boy, you thinking? set this up beautifully. <laughs> I try. You set it up beautifully, Sam. Um, up till about the sixth century, the images of Christ in the catacombs, in mosaic tiles that were discovered, were Jesus was boyish looking, no beard, curly hair, Roman looking. 
Mm. For five centuries, it all changed in the sixth century. Mm. It all changed. Why did it change? Because something was discovered above the Western Gate, the image of Edessa in the sixth century. That's when it was discovered. And that had long hair, mustache, the whole bit. And there is a famous painting in St. Catherine's Monastery in the, at the base of Mount Sinai in Egypt called Christ Pantocrator. You've seen it. If you've seen it, if I showed it to you, you say, oh, I've seen that a thousand times. That was created in the 6th century, and it's believed that the shroud was used as the model for the painting. Mm. So up till then, boyish looking, curly hair, no beard. There are also coins minted in the 6th century that have the likeness of Christ on one side with the face, the bust of, of the shroud face is what was used to create uh, the coin. Okay. So uh, it, was, it wasn't until about the 6th century that the shroud was used as a model. And all the famous paintings of Christ that we have had down through the centuries use that face as its model. But I know I wanted to say about John Jackson and about the cloth. He has a theory that the cloth was used uh, on the table at the Last Supper, is his theory. Oh. It was used at the table. And then when you take it in the Catholic Church, you have... And he said, this is my body, this is my blood over the white linen. Well, what does the priest do over the white linen? This is my body, this is my blood. That it was used symbolically in that way and that the Catholic Church took it and the Orthodox. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called ep epitaphios in, 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 the, in the Byzantine, in the Greek Orthodox Church. And it is the burial uh, cloth of Christ on the altar used in the sacraments That's interesting. and it's thought that maybe it was the burial cloth oh, uh, used the at the last the supper cloth. was used uh <laughs> the tablecloth was used it's it's controversial a lot of scientists will tell john jackson phd in theoretical physics john stick to the science that's kind of wishful thinking can't be proven a lot of scientists are saying you know Stick, you know, you, is he making a? Is, is he have like a scientific reason for it, or is it like a theological reason? I think theological, okay. yeah, theological. Sorry, I think you'd find a bit of uh, breadcrumbs on there too. However, there's inter uh, It's interesting you should say that. I've been to his uh, facility in Colorado Springs, spent some time with him, and um, he said, "Dave, I want to show you something." He said, "This is my one regret of the stir." testing in 1978 he led the team he showed me on one side of the cloth equidistant about maybe 12 inches going down the length of the cloth 14 feet it looked like stains drips from something that dripped onto the cloth several stains you go 12 more inches more stains 12 more inches more stains you know if the Apostles were reclining on one side and took the matzah and dipped it in the dish uh, and then brought it to him. It may have dripped equidistant all the way to, he said, if I'd have known or if I'd have thought about it, I would have had those stains tested. Because if you find wine or, you know, something from the Passover, yeah. In those stains, then you could say maybe this was used as a tablecloth during the Passover, the Last Supper. It's a, it's a very interesting. And, you know, when the guy who it's his theory is telling you about it, it sure looks good. <laughs> right. And so, um, but uh, probably we'll never know what those stains are. Wow. But it's interesting that you should mention that. Is there any, uh, yeah. yeah. This thing goes... In many directions, you know. That seems to be the its strongest its strongest property is the fact that there are so many directions that corroborate um, all these different facts. So, and it's it's not one thing; or it's not just the image, right? Right, it's, right. It's not just the particles. It's the not just, yeah, yeah. Uh, there, the, the, its strongest view seems to be that there's so much yeah. that's in this one realm. Yeah, yeah. Join us in part two for the rest of the conversation.